is if we want to make a difference, we have to step out of our comfort zone and into the discomfort of others to be able to use our gift to help others. And that boomerang brings blessings back. Well, hi guys. It is great to have you watching along. Uh, you know, as you know, one of my favorite thing to do is to find other kingdom entrepreneurs around the world who have a couple of things. One, a track record, and two, a heart after God. And, uh, and my guests today, uh, you're going to learn so much from. Uh, it's a long journey that they've been on. They could possibly be the most wonderful example of ministers in the marketplace of all the podcast episodes we've ever done. You know, everybody we've interviewed has done, you know, different elements of the journey, but these guys, their love for people, their love for humanity, their love for the team uh, is infectious. And, uh, and it kind of started through a challenge, I guess, that they solved. Uh, it's great to chat with you guys. Um, you're going to be a blessing to both of us, all of us that are listening. Why don't you introduce yourself? Who is Tony and Mary Miller? Well, Tony and Mary Miller are a couple in Cincinnati, Ohio, USA. And we are always seeking for the Lord's guidance. And we've been, <laughs> we've been broken for a long time and blessed beyond belief. We both are actually on our third marriage, but we've been married. We'll be celebrating 32 years next month. Wow. So this one has worked, and I think that uh, God had divine plans for that. Blended family of five kids, 11 grandchildren, and almost 600 employees at JNCOA that we have transitioned to the second generation. So we just get to celebrate with them now while they do all the hard work. Love it. Cincinnati, Ohio, hey, Bengals fan and all, or not even? Oh, yeah. I've been a lifelong Bengals fan. I'm a native, so this past couple of years with Joe Burrows has been a whole lot of fun. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That's cool. Uh, I'm a closet uh, American football fan. I, I We actually, I played, I played American football in Australia. Um, oh. Yeah, which, I mean, I, I don't want to over-romanticize it. Like we could never field a full team, so you the same. We were offense, defense, water boy, clean up, janitor. Like <laughs> we were, but we loved. Like we were in the business when I joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we were, we were everything. Uh, that there just wasn't enough people to make up enough teams, but it was a whole lot of fun. Um, okay, so um, so take us back to the origins of Janko. When was it, and uh, and and how did it start? Well, Tony doesn't usually like sharing this story. Right? Yes. <laughs> Tony was going to college at the University of Cincinnati, and one of his professors of economics talked about the future of service industry. So this was back in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. And Tony noticed one day, because he's a very good student, how dirty the floors were of a bar he was attending. And so he decided he found a way to pay his bar tab regularly. So we start cleaning the bars around the campus. You know that broken glass and puke that's on the floor? <laughs> when you're laying in it, it, it really smelled to me like money. <laughs> right. There's, there's money in puke. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Somebody's got to clean it out. Absolutely. So Tony was doing full-time student, working full-time, just trying to make his ends meet. And his father had been to have heart surgery. And everything was supposed to be okay. He was like number six ever yeah. in heart surgery with a bypass wow. surgery. And he didn't survive. He died during recovery. So Tony left university and started Jancoa because all he knew was cleaning. And he wanted to find a way to support his mom and three siblings. When, when my dad died, um, I'd been up there with him to see him and he was going to go in and have the surgery and I was going to UC and he said hey I know you got that exam I want you to go back and take that test I'll be fine here and so I drove back from Owasso in Michigan and it was and I got back and I went in and I took the test and uh, I called up there and I said say so how's dad how did he do in the in the surgery and uh, my uncle was on the phone, and he said, I'm really sorry. And I go, sorry about what? It never dawns on me 
that he doesn't make it. And so he dies in the recovery room. Well, I'm so mad at God because I'm thinking that God's got this. He could, he doesn't, he let my dad die. Why would he do that? I mean, he's God. He could have made sure that he got through the recovery and that he'd be okay. But as soon as that happened, I quit school and started cleaning these bars full time. I, I couldn't get past the full point that God would let my dad die. And that's just how I felt. And luckily, he's worked through that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wow. I, I think it's a great testimonial because many of us have had times wow. where we were angry with God and didn't understand how something really horrible could happen to us in our lives. You know, I, so I, think, I think it it will all make perfect sense, right, on the other side of glory, because that'll be your first question. What, why? Yeah. And then there'll be an answer, and the answer mm -hmm. make total sense. Yeah. But it's very hard to, on this side, uh, you know, of heaven, kind of rationalize things. Yeah. Is that 50 years ago now then? that It was in 1972. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. A, that's a solid that's run. Years. Yeah. And I came along about 20 years later, and a mutual friend introduced us to each other, and they told him to stay away from me because they really liked me. So I think that intrigued them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it didn't take too long, and we were both decided it was time to get together, and we got married, and I'd been in sales for a long time and decided we decided to put all our energy in the, the family business. At wow. that time, we had 65 part-time employees, and that was, I start working with them in Jancoa. We got married in 1991, and I start working with them at Jancoa in 93. Uh -huh. May of 93. So it's just been my 30 years so that I've been working with Tony at Jancoa. And now the second generation is running our oldest daughter and her husband and Tony's youngest brother. Right. And they they bought the majority of the company from us. And Great. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, well, that's how you were able to get to Australia on a cruise, you were telling me, right? It's because you, now that yeah. you're, 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 all, you're all footloose and fancy free. Um, so, so... I think, I mean, I'm pretty familiar with the business that you're in. Uh, I mean, I was born in the UK. I had a cleaning company there. We did a little bit of um, office cleaning, but mostly high rise window cleaning. Um, and I've got a lot of clients here that have done um, domestic and, and commercial cleaning. You you picked a, a business that is probably quite easy to do as a one or two person business because there's a very low barrier to entry. Right? It's just, can you get a mop and, and some cleaning products and get going? So low barrier, to, but a very hard business to scale, right? Very, really easy to do as a one or two or three person, run a, few, run, a, run a small crew, but incredibly difficult to scale out. So um, t take us back to that, that period of time. Like what was that like, um, you know, that, that 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 okay let's go 1993 when you've got 60 whatever it was part-time staff like that that would have been a real challenge i would assume w what were some of the challenges there it's pretty much insanity is the only way to describe it we discovered and realized acknowledged that part-time people in our industry only come to work part of the time and not usually when you need them <laughs> no. and yeah. we knew we had to do something different but we were also blessed to be part of a program called Strategic Coach, and they're based in Toronto, and they also have a Chicago office. And while we've been married 32 years, we've been clients of that program for 32 years also. And so the Strategic Coach model is you, every quarter, you attend a workshop, and you have that eight one day to pause, reflect over the past 90 months, 90 days, and plan for the next 90 days. And I've actually been one of their coaches for the past 20 years at their Chicago office. And that for us, I think, is what really helped us. Like you said, how did we deal with these changes? Because of the different questions that were asked, that opportunity, most business owners, whether you're faithful or not, do not pause. They mm -hmm. just, right? Yeah. And it's really hard for the Lord to talk to us when we just keep moving. It's in the quietness that he'll whisper and guide us to what to do next. 
and sometimes amongst tears and crying. <laughs> but but it's, having that helped us a lot because it changed the questions we asked. So what we start, we were hiring 50 people a month mm-hmm. and still had a 400% turnover. Yeah. I hired a consultant to help us fix our problem. And on the second day of a five-day contract, he fired us. Right. The beginning of the second day. <laughs> He's, he was the first night, him and Tony, Bob was his name. Bob and Tony went out to survey and assess a couple of the key buildings we wanted to start with on how we could be more efficient and profitable. And Bob told me that he spent the whole night vacuuming, and that's not what we paid him for. And he really wasn't that going to vacuum or <laughs> no. That's why he quit. <laughs> um, so, okay, so that's really cool. So um, I'm keen to, because you, you said that you, they only work part-time and maybe not when you want, right? Because there's a lot of, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of early morning and late nights. And and so if it's the same as it is in Australia, you end up with a very ethnic workforce because they will happily do that work. But there's exactly. a language barrier, right? There can sometimes be a skill barrier. Like they, they're they happy to be there, but uh, a transport barrier, like there's a there's a lot of friction to that, uh, that demographic. So what was your solution to get those people uh, to work? We changed the question. The first question was not, where do we find people? But if we want to be the best cleaning company possible, and we want the best people who want to work in this industry, how can we attract them to want to work for us? We counted all the cleaning companies in our region. There used to be that Yellow Pages book before the internet came out. And there were 104 cleaning companies. So why Jancoa? Why would they choose us? And what would he have to do to not just attract them, but to train them so they can be successful in the role that they were taking on? And how can we get them to stay for a while? Because our mantra was, stay with us three to five years. We'll help you get clear on where you want to go next and help you figure out what you need to do to make that happen. Whether it's learning English transportation, education. We had one gentleman that was from um, Africa, Nairobi, I think it was, and he had been in the tel- um, computer industry there, but he had to get new certifications here in the States. So he worked for us for two years while he got the education he needed for certification. We ran it. We met him at our church at a training for p- prison ministry. He was sitting at the same table and he said, I thought you guys looked familiar. And he shared with us that he made, fr- made friends for life during the time he worked for us. Mm. So it's just creating an environment that people want to be part of. And you, all human beings, regardless of who you are, what you do for a living, everybody wants to be acknowledged and appreciated. Yeah. And that was something that we really start doing. And we used Coca-Cola and pizza. <laughs> Yeah. You know, start going around and having conversations. And when people feel seen, there's a whole different connection. When you pay them enough money where they can and work 40 hours a week where they can make a budget work, then they start bringing other people to you. Yeah. So our turnover reduced by 300% within the first 18 months. Yeah. Love it. So you, um, so I think from memory, like you guys were struggling to get people to turn up. Uh, because they don't have transport. So, you know, it's funny. There is a bit of a culture in entrepreneurship where business owners are a bit like, I can't even get my team to turn up. Like, what's wrong with them? Like, I'm paying them. Shouldn't they be here? You didn't take that approach. What was your approach? Well, Tony had taken that approach for a long time, didn't you? Yeah, I, that was my approach. <laughs> And, uh, he also thought if he just paid them more, surely they'll do the job. Then Mary came in and she said, I think we need to do this differently. And of course, I took that personal, like I was doing something wrong, you know. But she said, let's just look at it. Let's see what other options there are. And so we decided we needed a shuttle to go pick them up. And uh, that was their biggest problem was okay. transportation. Let me tell you a little bit more detail about that story, Okay. <laughs> Over the weekend, after we were fired by Bob, 
we went to a bunch of bookstores and bought every book we could find on how to find people, how to keep people, how to train people, just everything we could find. We were looking for the magic elixir. There's something somewhere that had the answer that was going to solve the problem. And after going through, and we we delegated other team members to read sections of different books and stuff too. So Sunday evening, we had this group group conversation to download and we we said, okay, who are the top 10 employees that we would want to clone? The clonable employee. And what are the things they have in common? And the number one thing they had in common was transportation. See, I'm not sure if this is the same problem your listeners are having or whatever. So I'm not saying just go get a shuttle, but to ask different questions about what they have in common. And it was, for us, it was transportation, the top five that we would hire a hundred more of each. They had transportation issues. So Tony decided, I mean, he started a business when he was 19 years old. So he decided to go out Monday morning, went to a car lot, bought a van, went to a sign painting store and had it painted, Jancoa employee shuttle, drove to the office and told our general manager at the time, I found an answer to our problem. And she sits back and folds her arms. She says, which one? <laughs> we had a few more than just the one problem of people, right? <laughs> our people problem. And so that's when Tony said, I've got the least amount to do. I'll even drive it, which was the, that was the magic in the mix was stepping into that role to be able to see and to be able to listen and to share. And he would come home because our people work 6 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. So he would drop them off at work, come home, take a nap, go back out at 2.30 to pick them up as they got off work and would get home at 3.30, 4 o'clock. And he would wake me up to share the stories of what he heard and what he saw. And it was, it broke our hearts. Mm -hmm. And once the Lord <laughs> breaks your heart, you can't keep doing things the same way. What were some of the things that you were hearing, the real life stories of the needs? Well, we didn't have a way to work and from work. And we had this woman by the name of um, Rita. And uh, yeah, he's reading the Dream Manager book, but she was Gloria and Gloria. Real so Gloria had this uh, where you drop her off at home and, and uh, she would have to go into this apartment and she'd go up the stairway and uh, the light would be broken in the stairwell, so she would be afraid uh, to go home, to go home, and so would make sure that she got in. I'd make sure that she got in safely and that she could go up to her apartment and get in there. And what I found was each person I dropped off had their own story, something that they were afraid of that wasn't working out. And they didn't know how they were going to get to appointments during the day, doctor's appointments, getting their kids to where they needed to be. It was it was always something. Yeah. Or just having being able to speak English, to be able to talk to a doctor or a family member or something going on. Yeah. And I found out that they were just people. Yeah. And the more that I listened to them, the more that I uh, could recognize certain problems that were, you know, they happened a lot. Like if you're afraid when you get off at night that you can't get to your apartment safely, if you don't have um, enough food, if you don't have uh, safety, all these things that were just uh, seemed, I was unaware mm -hmm. of what real problems facing them were. Yeah. We had one gentleman from um, the Congo that had come into the office asking to see me and because he wanted to know how he could get his driver's license. So we connected, I was sharing with one of our team members that was helping with our dream engineer program. And he decided he was going to help him learn how to drive so he could get his driver's license so he could get around more because he had access to a car, but he didn't know how to drive. So Joe took a Saturday and was showing him how to drive and he ended up in somebody's front yard. <laughs> so Joe's like, okay, that's not the right way to do that. So Joe connected with a training company, a driving school, and connected this young man with the driving school. And several weeks later, he came back, he drove to the office, 
and asked for me again and wanted to show me his driver's license and wanted to take his picture with me and Joe to send to his family in that, that were still in Africa. Uh, I mean, that was a trophy. Mm-hmm. And he got his driver's license. And so many of us just take that for granted. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, while I think a lot of employers take a lot of their team for granted, like basically the, the shift for you is that you became more interested in them or maybe equally as interested in them as a human, as a profit center, right? Oh, absolutely. We started looking at the balance of we, we always, our customers never knew we were short people. Yeah. We always did a great job. The building always looked clean. We have been known for years for being the best in our community. You know, if you hire Jan Coe, you know it's going to look great. And so the customers didn't know. So we we had that right. And Tony being in charge of the operations, he would do whatever it took to make sure those buildings got cleaned. The customers were taken care of. But the, the employees were just like you said, it's easy to get into the cleaning business. You get a mop bucket, a broom, you know, all those different tools. And people were on that list. Mm. So we start seeing the humanity. Mm. And we start, it's a balance. We treat our employees with the same respect as we do our customers. Love it. With communication, our our values are chow, our son-in-law came up with chow C3. It's commitment, communication, consistency, accountability, integrity, and opportunity. And those are the things that's woven through everything we do and how we do it. That's our filter. Mm. That's awesome. So the bit that I'm in the business person inside of me wants to dig something out here, right? So you picked an industry and I don't know if it's exactly the same as it is in Australia, but in Australia, if you were to go into this industry, it's low margins, um, high turnover of staff, incredibly competitive. There's a lot of wage theft because it's a, um, non-speaking community typically. So they they underpay them. They they can't go to the solicitors or lawyers because they don't even know how to start that process. So they kind of get away with it. And then it's a lot of under table bribes to get contracts, right? So that's that's so I look at that and then I go, but you you guys made the decision to invest heavily in, I guess, you know, like buying the bus, loving on the people, taking the time. And the business person inside of me goes, What was that like, like that decision to forego short-term profit to do all of these great initiatives in exchange for a long-term vision? Like that, because that's entrepreneurship. Uh, That's a beautiful question. That's one of Tony's favorite questions because the founder, a strategic coach, asked Tony that once. So how much did that cost you when you started that up? Because that had to be expensive. And your response was, What he did is he told Dan that we've got all the the accountants worked on it. We added it all up and it cost us a grand total of 50 cents. When you look at how much we spend on that turnover, when you can go take your turnover from 400% when you're doing background checks and drug testing and training and all those things. And usually if you put bad people out there, they take their people away, the good people, they tarnish them. But when you get rid of all that and you have enough people of the same people, we start cleaning 5,000 square foot more per hour than our competitors because we had the same people every night. And right. human beings is the same no matter what it is. You do the same thing the same way consistently. You become much faster at it. You must have been driven by long-term vision and not short-term profit. Okay. Otherwise, you could not Absolutely. make these decisions, all right? And, and well, it, Tony and I, a long time ago, when we started together, we, we decided to invest back into the business when we were making a profit and things like that so that we, as we grew, I mean, our kids never had any desire to work in our business, until things start going well, we start getting awards and recognitions and we were growing. Different people at different times that had the skills that we needed joined us. Yeah. And it made a, a huge difference. But it, it was a bigger vision. And the vision was we wanted to live the entrepreneurial dream 
you build a business and you sell it to retire. Mm -hmm. And Tony and I looked at each other and who would buy this mess? <laughs> we would have to pay them to take it. <laughs> so our, our total plan and that started in the mid 90s was let's build this business that somebody might want to buy one day. That it would have value. And I mean, and today we've got 85% market share. Yeah, well, I think one of the big things is caring about people. I mean, genuinely caring about them as human beings. And, and what can we do to help them? What are the things? Um, and so we've had customers who did not treat our, our employees right. And we found they, yeah, what is to me is, is that they said, well, you can't do that. We said, no, we can't. If you cannot treat our people with respect, then we don't want your business. It's true. Mm -hmm. And when you have that philosophy and you do it and come and your employees see that you value them. Got their back. Then I, I, you build this bond with them. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is when we just wanted people to stay three to five years and then we want you to outgrow us. And no one in our industry was saying, hey, we want you to stay and then I want you to leave. And once we did that, it kind of like opened up the door for us to do the best we could for them. And then they started doing the best they could for us. Yeah. And, and again, we're not, we're not trying to hold people back. We don't want to hold them hostage. We want them to have opportunity. We want them, whatever you need to move, move on, tell us what it is. Let us help you do it. We've had people leave and come back and say, no, you don't understand. They're not Jan Cohen. This is family. And we intentionally, I've had a lot of investors and business people say, oh, no, you never use the your employees. We do. And it works. Yeah. Sometimes people that take advantage of it, we've had to deal with that. You know, there's no perfect on the other side. There's always that moving thing that you have to manage and take care of. But it's but there's been way more positive stories than negative. It, it's interesting because I'm trying to distill the the what are some of the keys for our listeners and one of the things that I've wanted business owners to do for a long time in terms of just thinking is, and you guys have done it exemplary, you kind of made your team your customers. Oh, yeah. They're our interior customers. We got the exterior, the building property managers in that, and we've got our team members that are internal customers. Yeah. We may pay them, but it's because of their work that we can serve the external customers. Yeah, and, and and as you grew the business and you became more of the leaders, your focus was less on the building managers because you knew that if you looked after the team, the building managers would be fine, right? Well, it was crazy. The building managers said, I mean, we, in 2008, there was four years or five years, we doubled our business. And that was because, and we didn't have a sales team. That was because we have customer service managers that take care of our customers. They see them regularly. So they have a relationship. So those customers know how much we care. We invest in them to begin with. And if there's a problem, they are not over the top end of the world. They will let us resolve what that is. And they communicate with us so we have that opportunity. One of the biggest issues probably you've experienced in Australia as well is uh, customer theft, where employees steal things from the customer. And, you know, it is always the janitor's fault. <laughs> That's right. Everybody thinks it's the janitor. And I remember specifically years ago, one of our customers' buildings was being built out. A new suite was being built out. And we got a call that $25,000 worth of computers had been stolen and it had to be the janitors. So Tony went with to the building to meet with our customer and he brought a check with him that I wrote for $25,000 to that customer. And they, Tony heard that as he was walking down the hall complaining about the janitors and how could they do that? And when he got there and he knocked on the door and they stopped talking and Tony gave him the check and shared with them that if we were the last ones in the building the night before and everybody left, we're the last ones there. And when he came in the next morning, something's missing. 
chances are it was us. And the main boss looked at our contact and said, we treat our customers that well. And he refused to take the check. Wow. Yeah. He said, let, let us do a little more investigation. And what they found during the build out, they had passed out the key code, the code to the to get into their suite to more than a dozen different people. They mm. had no idea who else had access in the building. So being putting our money where our mouth is mm. and stepping up, seeing the customer regularly, investing in them by having somebody go talk with them, talk with the tenants in the multi-tenant building and build a relationship so they know us and having an HR department that works in our managers and training our managers and supervisors to take care of our team, that's how we balance things out. Love and it. it's not always smooth. When you've got almost 600 people, there's always some kind of chaos to be dealt with. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, tell me about the dream cards that you brought in because that's, I mean, I haven't been to your office, maybe one day, but that that's an incredibly practical, touching initiative. It's it's actually not even that hard to do, but man, it carries a lot of weight. It does carry a lot of weight. As we were doing the programs with the transportation and the housing and the language and the finance, the budgeting and that we were sharing with a friend of ours, another entrepreneur from Atlanta, Phil said to us, you know, what you guys are doing is helping people achieve their dreams. And we looked at each other and said, okay. And so we played with it. And that's how we created the Dream Engineer. And that was the name of our program specifically to help our team members pursue their dreams so they weren't working just from paycheck to paycheck. So every new employee fills out a card, what is your dream? So that they have something they're working toward. And today, I mean, there's so many amazing stories, but just Haley, who works in our HR department, she filled out the card. She had talked about maybe wanting another child, having their own home, and her husband would really like to own his own business. And she thought they were all like, stretch out no way. Within four years, she had an, her third child, they bought their own home, and her husband started a, a bakery. And he sent it's being amazing. The Bengals actually buy their donuts from this bakery and talk about it all the time. So when people have something they want to achieve and work toward, that's when magic happens. So hey. it's the dream manager, a dream engineer, and the book, the dream manager by Matthew, Matthew Kelly, that was inspired by what we created at Dream Engineer. Well done. Well done. I love it. Um, Okay, so uh, so you sold uh, a large portion of the business. What role has what role has giving played over that time to church to other things? What has because I mean, no one needs. I had a quick look online at what your annual revenue is. No one needs that much money, right? No one like at some point. I'm sure that it's, if you're going to be that generous to your team, you're going to be that generous across the whole of your life. So what role has giving played in that journey over those 50 years? Huge part, huge part. Uh, we are, we've been big time tithers for many years, same with the rest of our leadership team, but we're also, per, I've been personally involved on boards of nonprofits and I had, I mean, the more publicity we got in our community, the more ask I got, yeah. right? So I had to create a filter. And this is something a lot of business people don't realize that we have this opportunity to, and I decided my number one role as the CEO of Janco is to make sure Janco had benefited from everything I said and did. So Janco was priority. The second, is this something that would benefit our employee team and their families? Yeah. Something in that aspect. Is this something that is part of my unique ability and gift that I can do? And is this going to be an add to my life or a, a take energy away from my life? Is this something I'm passionate about? Mm -hmm. Those four things made a huge difference. Like United Way here in Cincinnati has always been very big and they have, they create all kinds of programs that help team members that work for us, our families. Yeah. 
the YWCA has amazing programs to eliminate racism and to empower women. The sort of the bus, the transit, the public transit served on their board for a number of years as we tried to improve the public transit to help people get to where they want to be. And it was really funny. The timing is so crazy. I had an appointment this morning because I'm sitting to waiting to see this doctor. All's okay. But I had this doctor, a woman comes in and we were talking and she said she had her cart with her stuff in. She says, yep, I get to where I need to be, me, Jesus, and Metro, which is the name of our public transit. So it was really great to see people are benefiting. We also were very involved with the Gehring Center for Family Businesses. They helped educate us on what we needed to do to have a successful and healthy transition and to meet some of the right people. See, the thing is that I found, Wes, is if we want to make a difference, we have to step out of our comfort zone and into the discomfort of others to be able to use our gift to help others. And that boomerang brings blessings back. And the programs that we've gotten involved in that help our team members, Catholic Charities brings a lot of immigrants and refugees into our community, and they've already got the documentation that we need. And so we very closely with them to be able to do that. But there, it's not going to just come to you if you sit in your office and try to figure it out on your own. It, it's go, moving yourself out there and having real conversation with your team members. We, Tony assumed that every team member should buy a home when we first started our home ownership program. And not everybody wanted a home, mm, did they? No. <laughs> so you would have to be willing not in technical. I love technical. I, I, I'm a tech geek. I got iPads, iPods, iPhones, and the whole bit. But if you want to connect with your team, do it over a, a break, a lunch break. Bring the pizza, Coca-Cola, or whatever is appropriate in Australia, or whatever country you're listening to this from. Sit and break bread and ask, ask questions. If you want to help be a great dream engineer for your team members to help them build a life outside of paycheck to paycheck, you have to ask, you have to really care and listen to what they want to say, but you have to la ask and be quiet and listen. Mm. And it's not your job to do it for them. Ach confidence comes from personal achievement. And as people achieve and take steps, and we don't do it all, then we would connect them with some of these agencies that had programs. Mm that they can work through these different steps to make things happen. And that empowered them to do more. Yeah. Rolanda, one of my favorite stories, he's been with us for 18 years yeah. now, I think. And he came from Guatemala with a young wife and two young daughters for a better quality of life. Yeah. And Rolanda was serious. We have this thing we do, positive focus. Every meeting we have, people have to share something good that's happened over the past week or month. Yeah. And Rolando always shares what he needs to make things better for his team. So that's good. But tell us what's already working. And if you see him walking down the street in Cincinnati, he'll have a serious look because he's trying to figure out how to make something work better. But if you stop and talk to him, he smiles. Because those yeah. two young girls, today they graduated from college and they're both nurses working at one of our biggest hospitals in this community. Yeah. Yeah, and that's when we know we're yeah. following the Lord. Yeah, well, you're literally um, creating generational change outside of your own family tree. I mean, it's massive. So, I mean, I, I, it's an incredible story. You, you've, you've, you've handed over the business to a large degree. What's next for you guys? Because you're just hitting second gear now, right? Like you, <laughs> you're uh, right. That, 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 you've done your apprenticeship, right? Now, you, now you've got so much. <laughs> knowledge, wisdom. Now you've got time and capital. What's next for you guys? We're going to take another cruise to Australia. No. <laughs> yeah. I know that, but we actually are reimagining Dream Engineer. Matthew Kelly still does the Dream Manager and he works with companies slowly on their employee engagement and turnover and retention. We are taking our show on the road and I've been reimagining Dream Engineer's website and putting you out there to get on stages to be a 
professional speaker and to do workshops for large groups of people to get people excited. I, I call it stirring the pot of possibility to be able to get people excited about it and find groups of coaches that want to do one-on-one -on -one conversations to help people individually while I do large group excitement. Yeah. And we're really, we yeah. can change the lives of 10 million people being excited about their lives. I think we just feel like we're just getting started. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think this is, yeah, and I think this is really the beginning. And I think that's what's really exciting is how many lives can we change? How many people yeah. can we just encourage? And how, how can we just listen better? Be better listeners. Yeah. And uh, encourage them to go after what they really want to do. And, and we hear people sometimes say, well, I don't know if I can do that. I go, well, I don't know if you can either, but you yeah. won't know if you try. Get yeah. in there. Yeah. The worst that can happen is you can fall flat on your face, but you'll be able to pick yourself back up and go again. And maybe you'll be better the second time. You know, but that's exactly everything. what you started out with at 19 years old, I'm sure. What yeah. could go wrong? I can fall yeah. flat face and I can start something else tomorrow. And I, and I think when I got mad at God, it, it was really kind of the beginning because everything's not going to go great. And so when I got mad at God, I had to look at him and say, this isn't God. He wasn't trying to be harmful. He wasn't hurting anything. And there's going to be setbacks. And, and I've probably loved my dad more today than ever, you know? He he died, and that's just how it went. But he was the sixth person in the country to have uh, this operation. And from that, they learned a lot. They learned what didn't work. So he was instrumental and lots of other people coming behind him that, that did success for having heart surgery and things like that. So it really wasn't a failure. It was a success. And uh, and I love him for that, that he stepped yeah. forward and said, hey, I, I'm going to take a shot at this. And, he, and they were. Love it. And the surgeon, hey, I can tell you that Lots of people benefited from this, so thank you. And I, I think that God's always there, and He's always available. And I may not understand this, I may not understand, but I learned that you know what, God's got a point. Yeah, love it. All right. So one of the things that we always do on the podcast is, um, I'm sensitive to uh, those early years, right? I remember when I first started in business, it was. It was lonely. It was tough. You have more questions than answers, right? And and there are people that are listening to this right now, and they might be going for a run on a treadmill, mowing the lawn, whatever, driving, and 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 they are they are at the start, and and they are questioning everything. I just want to give you free reign. What would you say to those people who right now are like, I'm not sure about anything. Am I doing it right? You know, am I called for this? What would you say to those people? But your timing is so beautiful. We had two of our daughters come today and bring their kids and swim in the pool where we live in a condo. And they were sharing stories about when we would have to go do dumpster diving or something at work. And we would drop them off at the movie theaters and then give them money to just go see another movie. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's messy. Life is messy. And when you're trying to do it, just... Take that pause. Find a find a program or a partner that you can meet with regularly to pause and reflect over the each quarter. What's working? What's not working? And really take a look at that because a lot of the times the things that are not working, you don't want to totally get rid of it. You want to look at it because every time we step through that obstacle and looked and see, okay, what can we do? What what are all the issues? What's something we can do to move this forward? That's where the transformation took place. Yeah. We're unique in our industry because we took on the people issue in a very different way. You know, Tom Peters is an iconic business leader and on business excellence. And I had the opportunity to meet him years ago. And he says, you have to tell me, how did you come up with this? It's genius. He said, I said, well, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. We were in desperation mode. We had to do something different because failure was not an option. So, right. And I think communication, like Mary and I are working together in the business. Oh, that's been easy. And, and being married, being and having this and having kids and all that stuff, uh, 
there would be times that I would want to be mad at Mary. That I know you can't believe that, <laughs> but I did because something was screwed up, and, and I would say, "No, this is really a fine mess." And she would. The thing that would upset me the most is she would say, "Well, what do you think we can learn from this?" <laughs> I'm like, who wants to learn from this? I want to avoid that. I just want to get angry. <laughs> I just want to be mad at. Yeah, I don't do that well. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm an activator. I want to move on to the next thing. So let's figure it out what we can do to turn this around. She's writing things down like, well, we could do this. And I think we learned this. Maybe not do that again. Oh, man, it was so funny. She had anybody. We bring the best out of each other. Yeah. That's the thing that if you're working with a spouse, and in our industry, there's a lot of family businesses, a lot of spouses working together. And just remember to love each other. Yeah. Because it's one day you will be moving on. And the, the business is not the number one priority. Your relationship is. Yeah. You know, with us being retired now, so can you say it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tony has dementia, and it's still mild. That's why he's still making. Listen, <laughs> sometimes, 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 sometimes. But I think this, this is what I think anyway. Is that I have this gift of dementia, which means I'm losing my mind, and I don't have the mental faculties to uh, do a lot of things. And what that gift does is. I don't take any days for granted. Love it. I want to best day I can live. So when I get up in the morning, I just check to make sure I know where I am and who I am. <laughs> now, if I know those two things, and who I am, and I'm there, yes, I'm gonna and those things. If I have that, I'm gonna have a great day. Yeah, yeah. And that's a gift because I want to make sure I live the best, the most I can out of each day, rather than assuming that I have forever. Just yeah. taking today and have it be a great day. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Well, you guys are incredible. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably the 7,000th person to have said that to you. But uh, but really, like, you, you know, that that you've obviously got a heart for people that's come from a heart from God. Um, and uh, and you've built a great business. And, and under the next leadership, you know, let's believe that it goes to much, much bigger than it is today. Um, there's, there's no reason why it wouldn't, as long as they continue to love on people like you have. Uh, they are actually taking it. They, they listen to us more than we realized God. over the years because today they had the capacity and the team depth to be able to put things in place that we always talked about. Yeah, they they it's they're doing anything and they've already built the company's already grown since we've left. Yeah, we were the whole. <laughs> really appreciate you giving us your time. You know, like it's you know kingdom business is a tough gig and so for people to hear your story and and you, you you're still you're like a you're like a you know lovey couple still and and you laugh a lot and i'm like you know it doesn't all have to be heavy it doesn't all have to end up jaded um right. you know it, it can it can be it can be done well and you can exit and 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 do that dream and it's not going to be five minutes it's decades but but uh, but you've done an incredible job um, for those of you who are listening, um, as we always do in the podcast, I want you to think about, you know, what's the one or two things that Tony and Mary said that really jumped out to you? Because there's really no point in listening to a podcast if you're just going to consume the information. You've got to take a minute, pause and learn. So in the comments, I want you to put there, what's the number one or number two things that these guys shared that really jumped out to you? Hey, thanks guys. You are a massive yeah. blessing and uh, I really appreciate you. And um, uh, hopefully our paths cross. It would be great to meet you in person. That would be wonderful. I look forward to that day.